Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. We're going to have our next round of lightning talks. We're going to begin first with Ethan Gates from Yale University and his presentation providing access to email archive via remote emulation. Wonderful. And can you all see my slides? Yep. Thank you so much, Ruby. Um, just arranging my screens a little bit here, but uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ethan Gates. I work as a software preservation analyst for the Digital Preservation Services Unit of Yale University Library, and I serve as the user support lead for the grant-funded Emulation as a Service Infrastructure Program of Work, referred to as EASY. EASY, which is funded by the Mellon and Sloan Foundations and hosted at Yale, has been working since 2018 to push the development of emulation technology and services in the cultural heritage and memory organization sphere, primarily by expanding the capabilities and community of the Emulation as a Service or EAAS framework. Emulation as a Service, which was originally built by a team from the University of Freiburg in the Baden-Württemberg Functional Long-Term Access Project and is now maintained by OpenSLX, is an emulator management server allowing users to remotely create, run, and share a wide variety of legacy computing systems and software. EAAS essentially combines the powers of multiple open source emulator applications and funnels them all through a single browser-based interface, putting virtual Commodore 64s right next to a virtual Power Mac G4 next to a virtual Raspberry Pi. EASY's goals are broad, and its emulation as a service technology is widely applicable across collections. We have spoken with archivists, curators, librarians, and faculty from a wide range of domain expertise who have all identified the danger software obsolescence poses to their preservation, research, or reuse of digital objects, and the potential for emulation to mitigate this danger. So email records have always been on our radar, but perhaps in the sense that to some degree or another, pretty much all software related activity is on our radar. As a hypothetical example, and to demonstrate the capabilities of remote emulation, I have extracted a sample PST Outlook data file from the public Enron email data set that was mentioned earlier today. And we'll now give you a taste of what it's like to interact with legacy content and software in the easy platform. Switch windows here, and hopefully you can all still see my dashboard. So this is the, as I mentioned, the um, browser interface for the Easy Stack. Um, we can explore a number of resources that are already preloaded here um, in our our cloud hosted um, uh, version of the platform. We have a number of different computing environments that compose um, various combinations of emulated hardware, operating systems, and software along with installation media for various legacy programs and what we call content resources, which in this case would represent digital material from a collection or, or data that is the, the target um, of preservation, the thing we are trying to render and interact and, and, and reaccess. Um, now the platform, Easy Platform offers a number of different ways to, to combine these resources and, and run them in emulation. I'm fond of our emulation project menu here, which takes a sort of mix and match approach. You can add various resources from the explore menu and put them all here. That's particularly useful if um, say you are not all that sure about um, what particular software or system is actually appropriate for um, your your digital collection material if it's a particularly mysterious object, for instance, um, but it also allows you a sort of centralized location to switch back and forth between different options. Um, and return to this menu quickly if you want to sort of like test one rendering environment against another. So in this case, even knowing that we have an outlook, uh, you know, email data file from uh, uh, the early 2000s, we have a couple of different possible options here, like um, of different installed versions of the Microsoft Office suite, so Office 97 running in Windows 98, but we also have Microsoft Office Professional 2003 running in Windows XP. Um, so for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to I'm going to highlight that Windows XP environment, match it up with our Kenneth Lay PST file uh, email inbox from the Enron data set and click run. And just as simple as that, we will be loading up uh, an emulation session. Um, as Windows XP sort of boots up here, uh, hopefully 
familiar interface um, from times gone past. Um, I will just note that because we loaded in an arbitrary file, an arbitrary file set rather than a disk image from a taken directly from a floppy or a, a hard drive, um, emulation as a service does automatically on the back end by default package things up into an ISO disk image in order to load it into emulation. Um, this just being because the ISO 9660 file system is very broadly compatible across operating systems uh, from the past 30 years or so at this point, um, which means we can essentially sort of just take um, one approach with our insertion method um, and be confident that um, that's going to work with a broad swath of emulated guest, uh, guest systems. Um, but there are different approaches we can take with that. That's all just to say that we are going to find our, our office data file that we selected before in a emulated CD-ROM drive here. Um, and because of that, this is a, a read-only file system. Um, so I am going to, in order for Outlook to um, properly interact and open with this file, I am going to have to take a moment and copy it over to my documents. Um, but hopefully at this point, you can see we are just interacting with Windows XP as you would have in the early aughts. Um, and you know, archivists, curators, collection managers, whoever have lots of options here for how to configure, render, um, and interact with their data, just sort of a little bit of a time machine, put them back in, um, in 2002, 2003, um, and, and interact with this data as you would have at the time. So we've copied that over to my documents. I will launch Microsoft Outlook 2003, improve our window a little bit here, and then from this point, it's a matter of actually going through and, and navigating the legacy interfaces in order to import that file. So I'll go through the menus here and find our proper format, our personal folder file .pst. Select from my documents. And they are, you can see the menu at this point already allows us to, to browse through the various components of the of the Outlook data file and select which we actually want to, to import. Um, in this case, just in the matter of, of time, I'm going to make a, a selection of a smaller folder um, for us to review, just to make the import go faster. But you can see at this point how, say, again, a curator, a collection manager could potentially go through all of, you know, open all of this data um, for the purposes of, of review. Um, whereas when it actually got delivered to a patron, a version of this could be created that only, you know, certain relevant sections or, or um, you know, some redacted information was left out. Uh, I'll select the Enron folder, select finish, that should have completed very quickly. And we can now browse through in Outlook 2003 and actually use the Outlook interface to read our various emails, um, search and use whatever functionality existed at the time um, in order to, to, to browse through uh, and even view attachments. In Microsoft Word. Uh, so there you have it. I'm going to go back to my slides at this point. One moment, please. Great. Now, of course, this was a hypothetical example using an open data set and a relatively simplified, clean workflow just to set the stage for our discussion here. I'd like to start complicating things using the framework of a real life workflow that I recently observed and assisted with at Yale. This process was triggered when a patron requested access to computer files, including email records described in the papers of a prominent legal scholar held by Yale Special Collections. In this real world scenario, what I'll call the obsolescence challenges of offering access to email records via Easy, which covers just more or less the same steps I just demonstrated, really only the first three boxes here. Um, they're really only the beginning, and they largely allied the multiple decision points. And in the case of a large and well-funded organization like Yale, the multiple staff and departments involved in archival access. The emulated Outlook content did not go straight to the patron the same way I just breezily screen shared the emulated Enron data set with all of you. It required multiple steps of configuration, review, and input from the digital preservation staff tasked with supporting emulation services to the digital archivist who originally extracted and had some context for how the collections born digital material had been described and processed up to this point to the reading room staff who were actually in direct communication with the patron. 
while I was on hand at the side of things here to provide support and guidance on the capabilities and function of the Easy Platform, it was Claire Fox in Digital Preservation Services, Alice Prail in Special Collections, and Genevieve Coyle in Public Services and Operations actually handing off material to each other at different points and determining not just whether this email and other content could be accessed in emulation via Easy, but whether it should and for how long, and not to mention the logistics of guiding an uninitiated library user through a probably very unexpected response to their access request. Over the past several years, as I've pursued these kinds of case studies with library and archive staff at various organizations, I often get hung up by the admittedly complex and occasionally frustrating technical questions posed by an emulation workflow like this. The intricacies involved with activating legacy copies of Windows XP, or the vagaries of the Outlook data file format itself and how it changed from one version of Outlook to another. But probably the biggest thing that I've learned is that while these sorts of questions are certainly challenges to the implementation of remote emulation as an access platform for digital collections, they aren't really the blockers. They are not the questions that make overworked archivists archivists uh, throw up their hands and say, well, emulation is a very promising option, but it's not viable. Um, in fact, archivists tend to have the most fun with questions like, what version of Outlook do I need in order to open this data file format? The much more discouraging factors in the sense that they actively hinder or block off entire workflows have to do with institution-wide patterns of communication, policy, and capacity. This is definitely laid bare in cases like the one I described at Yale, where multiple people or systems are involved. Sure, we could authentically interact with an Outlook data file in emulation using Easy. But what if, because of uh, personally identifiable information, the emulated version that the accessioning archivist saw needed to be different than the emulated version the patron saw? What if access policy and procedures say that a patron still needs to access material on site regardless of the remote tools and workflows technically available to staff? Could we follow up with the patron to ensure that remote emulation actually met their research needs, that they were able to contextualize the material they requested, that they were able to engage with it, cite it? If we send a link and a login to a grant-funded service like Easy, what expectations are we actually setting in terms of timeline, available uptime, and persistent access? So when it comes to investigating and encouraging the implementation of remote emulation access systems like Easy with email archives, the technical design and capabilities of emulation itself are only one piece of the puzzle and have to be taken holistically with factors that may be at least partially outside of our control, though not outside of our scope. To that end, because Easy is a program of work and not purely just about platform development, we're working on building resources and a community of practice that we hope can be used to bridge the implementation gap. Publishing case studies that focus on access to spe specific collections and domains like email archives will hopefully make its utility in real world archival settings less abstract. Meanwhile, by speaking and sharing more about internal access policies and procedures for remote emulation as they develop, they don't really exist yet, but we're working on them, whether at Yale or in some of our partner organizations in the Easy Network, we hope to boost advocacy efforts by providing adaptable documentation. And we have plans for dedicated user studies, user here encompassing a, a broad swath of roles and individuals from students to archival staff with varied accessibility concerns. Uh, and those user studies will hopefully make sure we're maintaining a direct line of communication to what the archives community actually wants out of remote emulation, not just what a handful of program staff think they should want. And to largely wrap things up, I would like to highlight that that approach has so far led to several goals or benchmarks for the Easy platform that I suspect would be of further interest for this symposium and email archivists in particular including more granular permissions and access controls, mimicking a, a virtual reading room setup, which would allow public services staff more fine-grained control over the scope of access to running emulations. We're also working on a dedicated API we've dubbed the Universal Virtual Interactor, or UVI, that would combine file characterization information with detailed metadata gathered on the history of legacy software and file formats, 
um, to cut down on the amount of time that archive staff often have to spend manually looking at whatever finding aids or documentation exist about legacy digital material to determine what kind of legacy software or computing environments are actually appropriate for it. And finally, a, a big area of work that we're, we're currently undergoing is the potential for emulating entire networks, which put another way is to say we're working on connecting one running emulated computer to another running emulated computer. That would open tantalizing options for, say, importing entire email servers and preserving the ability to interact dynamically with email archives as one does with an active email service, rather than with just uh, static email exports. I'd love to discuss those possibilities or any other topic raised in this presentation more. Um, we've definitely got some time for Q&A now, so I hope we can answer some questions, but do feel, please feel free to reach out to me um, directly afterwards or to join us in the Easy Community Forum at forum.easy.cloud, where you can connect to more folks besides myself who are using and thinking about remote emulation services. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ethan. I'm going to start off with the first question from Emmeline. Um, is it possible to use several programs to read mailboxes, exports, and attachments in the same environment? You show the Microsoft Office and Word, but can we do more? Yeah, again, you are essentially bound only by the possibilities of what Windows XP or the operating system that you need could do at the time, right? Again, this is sort of a time machine in terms of like, I'm offering you a desktop PC from 2002, 2003, um, just, you know, running in your browser and uh, interacting in a window as if you've taken a HDMI cable to a monitor and like sent it back in time. Um, so the, that question there becomes essentially the limits of the software or the operating system or the program um, in question at the time, which certainly there are limits to that, right? There are drawbacks to having to go back and be sort of bound by um, the, you know, arbitrary memory limits of MS-DOS in terms of <laughs> loading multiple programs at once or, or what have you, depending on just how far back we're going. But with something like Windows XP or, or many Windows systems, right, you essentially can combine as many different pieces of software, install as many different pieces of software as you would like in order to craft, right, like that that perfect environment for your collection material um, that you're looking at in order to to, to render it the way you would like or the way your patron would like. Emmeline said, thank you and brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and I should say, just like from a technical perspective, we use essentially a, a, a derivative system, which is to say that so uh, where we also can share these environments with other other people between organizations, which is to say that once one person installs Microsoft Office 97, everyone kind of gets to benefit from that. Um, so it's not like every single user of Easy has to like reinstall Microsoft Office 97 every time they want to use it. This environment just exists now. Folks can can play with that. They can they can tailor it, derive from it, um, create copies like again that suit their needs. Um, and we hope that like that model cuts down on a lot of redundant effort. Um, and we do a lot of communication and thinking about how again we can we can improve on that redundancy in terms of just knowing that folks have a lot of the same dependencies sitting in their collections. Everyone with email archives will probably want various versions of Outlook or, or Thunderbird or whatever you want in the past. Um, so both on a technical approach and on a on a metadata and like sharing description approach we're thinking about how we can be in communication between organizations to say how can how can we share this how can we um uh, uh make sure we're not all all repeating the same effort not reinventing the wheel precisely <laughs> um so how does the learning curve for using the emulated environment affect the user experience do users require guidance to navigate the system effectively is there any training or demonstrated provided prior to the delivery of the files absolutely and it is in fact a double layered question right in terms of training of users because there's at least for now with the step of um having to introduce people, users at least somewhat to the easy platform, even if it's a, a small number of clicks to get to that, that running emulation um, that I showed you, there is 
we you folks have not used easy right like i said the the the, the patron the scholar who requested the files at yale had never seen our platform for before um so i know claire fox definitely came up with a whole document of you know instructions to say here are our credentials here are visuals here are pictures like of, of where to go what to click in order to get straight to the thing that you want um and we're definitely working on expanding again like i have a whole user handbook for for easy that is intended to help people again not just patrons but but archival staff and curators and or whoever else on on that level of things right getting to know this this framework and how to navigate it, our vocabulary etc um and we i've worked on workshops in person prior to the pandemic as well as you know virtual tutorials and and training modules to get people on board with that then there is the challenge also then of people not necessarily actually knowing or remembering how to use the emulated software itself, right? It's a time machine. We're going back 15 years to interfaces that people either haven't used in a very long time or sometimes have never used. In the case of Yale, again, we have worked with a student team in the past who have helped us with some of these tasks of installing these legacy programs and exploring and documenting them. Um, and we're talking about 19 20 year old undergraduates sometimes who literally weren't born when when ms dos was the, the platform of choice um so there is also definitely a step of of gathering together resources and trying to create educational material to sort of um ac across the internet gathering various you know retro computing hobbyist forums with manuals on the internet archive or whatever sort of sources we can we can muster in order to um tie that to what people are seeing and easy and, and reacquaint them um with with again with actual legacy computing functionality because that that is a concern and we're we're certainly aware with it and again working on ways of like how do we we tie that documentation kind of like more directly into the interface such that like when we showed I showed Windows XP running you know there was a there was a lot of space there on the side that in our ux ui designs is sort of um reserved for how can we link manuals from the internet archive sort of attach supplemental documentation to guide people through what they're seeing uh, but we're still just working on that like actively <laughs> linking and, and and working on the metadata model part of it okay well i want to thank you for your time and if anybody else has more questions feel free to send them um ethan can hang back and maybe type out some of those uh some of those answers if you want to go ahead and do that Absolutely. uh we're going to move on to our next lightning talk which is Catherine antonelli antonelli uh hybrid moments letters and email in conversation hello uh let me share my screen All right. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Let me know if I'm too loud, too quiet. Yeah, you sound good. Good. All right, and great. we see your presentation. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Um, all right. So yes, my name is Catherine Antonelli. I often go by Cat. I am the Martine A. and Bina S. Ben Rothblatt Digital Archivist at the American Philosophical Society. I am our first digital archivist. And today I'm going to talk to you about our first email collection that I'm working with. Um, which is part of a large hybrid collection. I'm going to uh, kind of share the journey so far with you. Uh, it's a bit of a bumpy ride and I'm still in the weeds. So we're going to do a little overview to start off so you know where we're headed. Um, the main thing that we initially wanted to figure out with this collection was how can we best represent correspondence over time, um, acknowledging the constraints of a traditional binding aid. And so I'll say up front that I don't have a, a revolutionary answer to that at the end here. This was definitely an expectations versus reality situation, um, but I will share the solutions that we have come up with. And so in the presentation, I'm going to briefly introduce our project, probably overshare a little bit about the challenges inherent in this particular collection, um, but hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, also discuss the ways that EPAD can potentially be used to enhance hybrid collection processing. And finally share what we have concluded is our best route forward with the finding aid, as I said. So the, oops, yes. The collection I'm talking about today is the Richard Garwin papers. Um, Garwin is a famous American physicist best known for helping develop the H-bomb. He later worked as an advocate for arms control and had a very successful career at IBM's Watson Laboratory. And I highly recommend his biography, uh, True Genius. 
there's also a great documentary about him, which I, I think is just called Garwin, uh, came out in 2014. Um, and so this was a decently large collection coming in, about 200 linear feet unprocessed, and that's not including the digital component. Uh, the digital component was mostly sent all at once, uh, and then we've also been getting email in batches as Garwin migrated it. Uh, a little bit more on that in a moment. So a little summary of our physical correspondence, because one interesting thing that I'd like to point out is within the born digital component of the collection, we actually have outgoing correspondence from the 1970s onward as script files, which are viewable in a text editor. And they look like this. Um, some of these are duplicates of the outgoing correspondence that we have in physical form, but some of them are not. Some of them are unique. So that was an interesting twist to know that we might need to represent these non-email but still digital files uh, or digital forms of correspondence as well. So as I said, this is the first email collection being processed at the APS, uh, the first time we're using EPAD. And pre-weeding, because I've not quite finished all the PII work that's necessary before we can put it into the discovery interface and get it online. Um, although it is currently available for researchers in our reading room. So tell your researchers if they happen to be interested in, in this particular field. Um, but pre-weeding uh, in EPAD right now, there are 320,137 emails from 54,811 correspondents. And that was quite surprising to see. Um, I mean, it's a lot of emails, but that seemed like a lot of correspondence. So I was immediately a little suspicious. Uh, we'll see what happened with that in just a minute, because relevant to this is there were multiple migrations in the course of us getting these emails into EPAD. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, because they were not all originally emails as we would think of them today. A lot of them came through Lotus Notes. And Garwin converted the NSF files from Lotus Notes into PST files before donating them. Uh, I know there were some questions yesterday around this, around NSF files. Um, so I will say that we actually seem to have decent success with putting them into EPAD, uh, at least in the body of the emails. But there are some issues with the metadata. Um, there were some dates that didn't migrate correctly, as well as some correspondent issues, which is what I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but for the PSC to MBOX portion, we were able to get the email commit license for EPAD, which is a fairly recent addition, but really exciting and helpful um, because it allowed us to convert those easily right within EPAD. There were also a number of pre-email inter-office messages uh, that were originally sent via an IBM proprietary system uh, about in the 90s. And those text files are currently still living as text files um, in the born digital component of the collection. So let's take a look at correspondence. Um, and I, I realized, uh, as I'm talking, that correspondence and correspondence are sounding very similar. So hopefully you're getting from context what I'm trying to say. Um, so our correspondence, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are currently using EPAD or have seen it before, but here's what the correspondent browse looks like. And here is the report view, which is a really neat tool where you can see correspondence over time by correspondent, um, which sort of generated this interest for us. Um, for example, in the Garwin collection, you can see the bump at 2020, where Garwin uh, re-engages enthusiastically with the scientific community to work on solutions to the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you would like to edit correspondence with an EPAD, it looks like this. Um, the line at the top is sort of like the name authority, and the lines below are other versions of the name, including email addresses. And so you can edit these correspondence directly in this window, but as you might imagine, that's a sort of challenging to do with 54,000. <laughs> so you can also download them as a text file. Um, and here I have to give a big shout out to our digital project specialist, David Nelson, who does our digital humanities work um, because he wrote a script to put this into a CSV format that I could work with uh, much more easily. And you can see that 
uh, CSV here or portions of it. Um, because what I wanted to point out here is uh, what happened is we have a lot of erroneous correspondence <clears throat> and those needed to be cleaned up. Um, I can tell that some of them are incorrectly parsed Lotus Notes addresses, uh, but others I'm not sure exactly what's going on with them, which is the disadvantage of having this as our first collection. Um, would the correspondence have been cleaner if the emails were originally in PST or even in inbox? Um, for that, I would love to hear from you all in the chat or in the Q&A. Do you have these same issues or is this maybe because of our NST to PST situation? Um, please let me know. Uh, but in the meantime, now that some of those inaccurate correspondence have been filtered out, Sorry, skipped a slide there. Um, we can make a comparison of the clean correspondence with the list uh, that my colleague Melanie made of the correspondence for whom we have physical letters. And that's exciting because it, uh, from preliminary steps, it shows that our hypothesis is correct. A lot of the same people were keeping in contact over the physical to digital transition. Um, and this, as I said, is exciting, but I'm, uh, Curious next how happy EPAD is going to be once I attempt to re ingest this big cleaned list. Um, it'll have to recalculate the correspondence and match them to the emails. Um, so that's my next step. So if anyone's done something similar with a, a big list of slightly chaotic correspondence, uh, if you have pointers, let me know. I'd love to hear them. Um, but that's coming up. Um, Quick little diversion here, just so I can make sure folks who haven't really used EPAD before can keep up, because um, I know this is a, a wide ranging symposium. Um, so I'll quickly summarize a couple of the other capabilities here. When you ingest emails initially, EPAD does entity analysis, and it also does authority control, which there's a, a great explanation and guide to that in the EPAD user guide. Uh, it also has a lexicon search feature where you can even create your own lexicon if there are certain groups of words or terms that you want to look out for in a collection. So this is a neat part of what I want to talk about because working with EPAD has introduced the concept of potentially processing email first in workflow. So thinking of all these capabilities we've just seen, if EPAD's drawing out entities and correspondence of note and possibly PII, all of these things can potentially help structure series, subject headings, um, all sorts of things within the physical materials as well, or within the digital files. Um, so I want what I want to think about here is uh, whether this can be useful to folks, maybe, maybe especially loan arrangers or um, those trying to do some quick higher level processing. Um, and there are certainly some issues with this still, because the email that you receive may be a different time span than the rest of the collection. Um, that was certainly the case for Garwin, as the proper email does not uh, start into 2001, uh, versus the rest of the materials, the paper materials start in 60s or 70s. I think the correspondence starts in the 80s. Um, but that's not so much the case for the newer collections we have coming in. Uh, which are coming from folks who were maybe more active in the 90s. Um, and so that's one issue with this approach. Um, additionally, uh, and here I'll, I'll call out my uh, colleague Sarah Newhouse from Science History Institute. She pointed out in her presentation on EPAD during the um, Philly area satellite of the BitCurator Consortium Forum, uh, that was earlier this year. Um, email correspondence does not reflect at all the total body of correspondence that a donor is putting out in their life. Um, if you think about how often you're emailing somebody versus how often you're texting somebody, or as mentioned earlier today, how often you send a, a Slack or other inter-office message, that's going to change the landscape of your correspondence and be different for personal versus professional contacts as well. Um, in the case of Garwin, he did both uh, personal and professional communication in one email uh, account. And I, I think that does happen pretty often. Um, so there are definitely issues here that are not new, but we should keep in mind and keep in the discussion. Um, but I still think uh, this is a really interesting tool and a workflow to potentially take advantage of. 
So finally, what's going on with our finding aid? Uh, we at APS work within the constraints of an existing style sheet for the finding aids. Um, so initially we were hoping to intersperse uh, digital correspondence with the physical correspondence, as you can see here, um, adding links to either EPAD or our digital library as appropriate. But unfortunately, this was going to be way too labor intensive uh, due mainly to the number of correspondence that we have both in the physical and the digital realms. So what are we doing instead? Uh, the standard solution that I've been seeing pretty much uh, everywhere people work with EPAD so far, um, but let me know if your institution has done something else. Um, what I'm seeing so far is mostly a blurb about the email and its availability at the top of the finding aid, um, including a link to the discovery module. And so that's what we're going to do. Basically, we're going to have a link to EPAD in the scope and content note, um, also at the top of the correspondence series, just for insurance. Uh, but we are also going to include an additional link um, to a downloadable file. And that'll have a list of the correspondence that appear in both digital and physical form. This is our sort of compromise to make sure that researchers have a, a faster control F style search method um, to see if the correspondence that they're interested in might appear in EPAD or in other places. Um, and so that helps us balance staff time with access, which for us means uh, or includes really making sure everything is pointed to from the finding aid. Um, all information is accessible from there. It's a centralized point, and then you can branch out from there. Um, and we're going to have a similar solution, uh, which is to say a downloadable file with a list of the script outgoing correspondence and the early email correspondence so that people can compare those as well. Um, and I think we'll leave it there for now. It is uh, still a lot of work to create these extra guides for a collection, but this in particular is a very important collection to the APS and will be uh, sort of a standard bearer as we look to reemphasize the strength of our history of science collections. And a bit of a bonus is that researchers should be able to get a starting point for their own um, data analysis based on these guides. And we're still hoping to do some fun analysis ourselves uh, on it for uh, our future digital exhibit that we have planned on Garland once the collection is fully processed. So um, thank you for coming on this journey through the Garland papers with me. I hope some component of this presentation was helpful or at least got you thinking, and I would love to discuss any aspect of it further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. I appreciate it. Uh, you, I wouldn't say it's airing out dirty laundry. It's not dirty laundry. It's just you were the first, um, did you say the first archivist at the institution? Uh, first digital archivist. First digital archivist, and yeah, yes. <laughs> I, um, I was, you know, a little reluctant to talk about an unfinished collection and talk about all of our, our work in progress and uh, but I think that that can be really useful um, when people find that they have uh, sort of the same challenges or, you know, the same file types. I've certainly been to conferences where I've seen a presentation and said, oh, I've seen that, you know, uh, that file format before. I didn't realize that you could do this with it or I didn't realize it was used for that. So, um, yeah, very happy to uh, sort of be the guinea pig and, and yeah, air things out, like you said. Well, the good thing about you know archiving is that not uh well the good and the bad thing is not a lot of institutions are doing it, which is why there's so much um there's many people here trying to learn and to get more information. So I think it is like you said very useful to be able to um, talk about unfinished projects and just kind of have like a sounding board with other people too. So anybody who has any questions, feel free or thoughts, you know, feel free to put them in the uh, Q and A and I'll go ahead and read them out. So we got a, a question from Rose. They said, wonderful presentation. I love the burger image. How long did you take to work on this project and how did you weed out the duplicate? 
So this um, project, the, uh, let's see, the EPAD portion of this project has taken about a year now, I would say. Um, I had uh, actually a number of challenges getting the uh, PSTs into EPAD in the first place and then um, ended up re-ingesting them when there was a, an update to the software earlier this year. So um, that's been a journey. Uh, I'm not quite sure, sorry, what you mean about the duplicates. Uh, if it's possible that you're talking about the outgoing correspondence script files. Um, and in that case, we are not going to weed those um, simply because there are, I think, over 7,000 of them. Um, and going through and checking those against physical correspondence would be too challenging. Um, it would, might be a different case if uh, it was the script files versus other digital correspondence that we had. But um, yeah, and the, the physical correspondence is, is folder level, not item level. So that would take a very long time. <laughs> So we have another question from Deborah. Uh, have canon canonical names been created for the various email addresses and nicknames for each correspondent, like the slide listing showing his mom, June, with I IDD? Yes. Um, so EPAD actually does that for you or tries to. Um, it uh, EPAD itself creates the canonical names, and you can go in and edit that canonical name if you prefer something else. So for example, I think um, Dr. Garwin's own uh, correspondent file, you could say, might have said initially like R. Garwin or something. Um, it, it probably said RLG actually, because that's how he signs most of his uh, correspondence. That's how he refers to himself pretty often. Um, but obviously for our purposes, we didn't want that to be the, the canonical name for him. Um, so we could go into EPAD and edit that correspondence so that when you looked at the, the list of correspondence in the browse, it would say Richard L. Garwin, um, but the software still knew that RLG referred to him. So another question from Sarah um, asked if you're planning to use EPAD for reading room access and if you can describe the setup if you've gotten that far. Sure. Um, we are definitely planning to use it for reading room access. We are um, quietly allowing that at this time. Um, we have a uh, reading room computer, um, fairly basic, uh, locked down so that um, folks can't get to other areas of the computer. Um, and essentially what happens is I go down and start EPAD for the researcher um, via the command line. And so the, when the researcher comes in, they uh, already have it open for them. They can right now just go to the Garland collection, but eventually once we have other email collections up there, they'll be able to select that. Um, and yeah, it works uh, very similarly to the um, processing interfaces, um, talking now about the, the delivery interface that the, or delivery module that the researcher would, would be looking at. Hopefully that's thorough enough, happy to answer other questions about that. Um, so our last two questions, uh, the first one, are there really 54K correspondents? I, well, so no. <laughs> <laughs> um, in that previous slide, uh, you saw that some of the correspondence were uh, a backslash or an equal sign. Um, and those are the, the I'll say errors um, that occurred, I'm guessing due to the fact that the emails were um, migrated twice and that they originally came from uh, NSF format. Um, how many correspondents there actually are uh, remains to be seen. Um, perhaps for a future uh, presentation, I can talk about exactly how many we winnowed it down to. But yeah, that's that was a number that I was right to be uh, suspicious of. <laughs> okay, so our last question from Jessica: Are there any restricted email files in EPAD from this collection? And if so, how are you displaying those files in the binding gate? 
There, um, there likely will be. Um, so something else that EPAD allows you to do is to sort of winnow down the emails that are available from each module. So you're able to uh, retain the emails in your preservation copy, um, but only present certain emails within the reading room or um, even restrict certain emails from appearing in the online uh, discovery interface and uh, only appear in the delivery interface in the reading room. Um, so if we do restrict files, um, we'll just include a note in the finding aid saying, you know, certain emails have been restricted for this reason, um, likely due to personal information. Um, these emails are restricted until XYZ year. Um, speak to an archivist if you'd like to learn more. Okay, well, so for all the questions that we have for today, I'd like to thank you and Ethan for coming and um, presenting on your email archiving projects. <laughs> of course, thank you for having us. Okay, our next session is going to be at 2 p.m. We're going to break for 15 minutes, and then we'll be back. Thank you. <laughs>